So here we are ready to take a look at all of the four classes of biomolecules. Now that we have a little bit of an understanding as to what makes um, organic molecules organic molecules, let's get into some of the main classes. This particular session is going to look at uh, the two classes, carbohydrates and lipids. Before that, it's important to understand that all living things use carbon as their backbone molecule and we can take those uh, all of the different molecules and really break them up into four classes based on consistencies in their structures what they're used for and there are these four main groups so carbohydrates is the first one and you know again you gotta love science words they sound tricky, uh, but they're every, you know, they're not. We've got carbo, guess what that's for? Carbon. And then we have hydrates. Well, we know that when you hydrate something, generally you add water to it. So when we talk about a carbohydrate, we're really talking about uh, a molecule that ha is made up of carbon, it's made up of hydrogen, and it's made up of oxygen. And generally we see these molecules set up in this one to two to one ratio where you have one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. That is not always the answer and it's not always perfect for a carbohydrate, but they generally exist in that setup. The monomer of a carbohydrate, the building blocks, all the four major classes are made up of smaller subunit molecules. And for a carbohydrate, the monomer is what we call a monosaccharide. Already we know that a mon, you know, mono means one, and then saccharide, you'll see that a lot, that means sugar. So when we're talking about the monomers for carbohydrates, we're talking about simple sugars. And these simple sugars have very particular functional groups that are associated with them, and the two most common functional groups in carbohydrates are ketones and aldehydes. Okay? They are also going to have at least two hydroxyl groups associated with them as well. So here's some examples. Fructose, which is your fruit sugar, has in it ketone. And a ketone is where you have a double bonded oxygen in the middle of um, the carbon chain. So somewhere associated to one of the carbons in the middle of the chain you have a double bonded oxygen and that's a ketone. Note that you have the OHs, there's your hydroxide groups. You're also going to have um, other sugars that have aldehydes and an aldehyde is a double bonded oxygen that's on the very end of the chain and this particular sugar is ribose. This is the sugar that gives RNA, it's R, <laughs> that's the sugar found in RNA. Carbohydrates tend to be very sweet, so that's why sugar is so sweet, uh, and sweet to the taste, and it is water soluble, so which means that these molecules are polar. Okay? And most of your monosaccharides are going to be built um, with upwards of five to six carbon atoms and they're either going to be in a line or most often they're found in a ring structure which you guys saw when uh, we did the little investigation on um, molecules and not for nothing and this really you know is kind of understated being way down here but our carbohydrates are our primary source of energy and they are the go-to molecule. So when we break down everything, we eventually want to get it down to a very simple glucose sugar molecule and we can bust those bonds for a lot of energy. So they're that primary source for cells. We can build many monomers together to create polymers, okay? And we know that we do this through condensation reactions. And for carbohydrates, when we start to create little tiny little short chains. Okay, so we're not talking very long, basically two plus, two to three monomers at a time. This is known as an oligosaccharide. So oligo means kind of like a few. And so for an oligosaccharide, you're just binding together a couple of those monomers. Okay, and so a disaccharide is an example. 
di means do. Okay, so if I have a disaccharide, that means I have a molecule made up of two monosaccharides. Um, examples of this are like sucrose, which is your table sugar, lactose, milk sugar, maltose, malt sugar, and so on. Here's an example. Here we have maltose. Maltose is the combination, um, basically, of two glucose molecules. And what you have is, if you recall, oh, just so you know, too, this is a little bit new. One of the shorthands of organic chemistry is to just never have to write in, because there's so many carbons. Why would you write them all in? So instead, we just make them as lines. And every vertice that you see where you don't actually see anything written, that simply means that there is a carbon atom there. So even though there's nothing there, at every point, at every vertice, there would be a carbon atom. So just not to throw you for a loop there. Um, so that's all that that means. <laughs> uh, so when we connect them, you can see that we're connecting this carbon over here to what used to be attached to an H to this carbon, which used to have a hydroxyl group, and it was done with a condensation reaction. For oligosaccharides, the reason why they're there is because they're a lovely transport form, meaning if I've got to move molecules from one point to another, um, there it's a good way to kind of move them around. Uh, and it's also going to create a structural piece, so we can use them to actually be um, structural components to living things. And then if I really want to start linking things together, I can create a polysaccharide. And we've already heard poly, just as a reminder, means many. So many sugars, many monomers uh, hooked together. Uh, here we can have a multiple, basically a ton of different covalent bonding patterns. This is going to cre help us create with three-dimensional structure. And polysaccharides are vastly important. Okay. One of the most uh, important is starch. This is the storage form of glucose. When plants are going through photosynthesis and building glucose molecules, they'll store it as starch because all it is is a wicked long chain of glucose molecules hooked together. Cellulose, very important polysaccharide. This makes up cell walls. And this is what allows um, basically plants to have their structure and have very solid structures because they can't walk around. Uh, chitin is another form. This makes up the cell wall of a fungus. So this is fungi cell wall, where cellulose is the cell wall for plants. Okay, and then glycogen. Glycogen is another storage form. Um, this is one of the ways that you know our liver will convert um, sugars into glycogen. So it's just another storage form. So here's a lovely little example inside a leaf there are cells here's your cell wall very thick structure gives it you know that rugged nature and if I cross section a cell wall this is one that is done with what's called um, basically an SEM excuse me scanning electron micrograph gives you that 3d feel okay these are all fibers cellulose fibers all interlaced and if I grab one of those microfibrils one of those fibers they are made up of strings and threads of cellulose or, and cellulose again just here's the glucose monomers let's just string them and bring them all together and there you have carbohydrates and for polysaccharides uh, we use them as an energy storage um, as well okay so they're for energy but most importantly they're structural Okay, they're going to build, build structure. So on to lipids. Uh, lipids, like carbohydrates, are molecules that are made up primarily of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The phosphorus and the nitrogen piece are there in way less abundance. It's very rare to find them. Really the only, and you'll find phosphorus more, uh, more often, and that's going to be in like uh, phospholipids. That's the place for phosphorus in a lipid molecule. The nitrogen, very, very rarely. But really, lipids are mostly these three, which may ask you, how the heck can I tell the difference between that and a carbohydrate um, if I'm looking at a molecule, if both are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? And the key lies in the ratio, how many of each ones you have. Remember, carbohydrates are that, two, or that one to two to one ratio. Lipids are a little different. Not to mention, lipids traditionally collectively 
are nonpolar molecules. They're not going to dissolve in water, whereas carbohydrates do. If I'm going to break down um, a lipid um, into its monomers, this is a little different in that it doesn't have this sort of classic building block uh, like carbohydrates and the others do, but we have fatty acids as the main, main, you know, main piece of a lipid. And a fatty acid is a chain of carbons, and note by this, it's usually a backbone chain um, of really around about 36 carbons, um, slightly less um, of 36 carbon atoms and just that link together with a carboxyl group. And remember our carboxyl group, COOH, which is structured as a carbon double bonded oxygen to a hydroxyl group. Okay, so that would hang out at the end. And so if you note here, you can see on this, we've got one that's completely, has every bond, single bonded, every open available bond to a hydrogen. On this one, you can see there's a kink in it. And that kink here is where I see a double bond of a carbon. And so this carbon is only attached to one hydrogen. This one's only attached to one hydrogen, where over here I would have those, that same number of carbon, except they're attached to two, and then these two double bond. Here you've got further kinks. So the more uh, double bonds I add, the more kinky the molecule gets. And as a result, this one is a saturated because it has all of its hydrogen. A saturated molecule, these two over here, are unsaturated. Okay. Fatty acids are very tail-like. Um, you know, they, they are the, fatty acids are the tail part of a phospholipid. You've got the head and the tail. Okay. Uh, they're nonpolar. You might want to ask yourself why. See if you can remind yourself what makes it nonpolar. Uh, they are sat when and when we have a fatty acid that's saturated um, at room temperature, it creates a solid. It's in a solid state at room temperature. All the bonds on the carbon are single bonds. So these are things like, um, you know, if you make uh, bacon in the frying pan, right, and you've got the grease. As soon as it cools down, it hardens into this really fat. You know, you can see that that grease. Well, that's a saturated molecule, and so all those single, all those carbons are single bonded. If it's unsaturated, which is a liquid at room temperature, some of those double bonds occur between the carbons. Triglycerides is a type of um, lipid as well. These are things like your butter, your lards, your oils. These are neutral fats. They carry no additional charge with them. They are a huge source of energy. Remember, the energy piece comes from when you have an atom that's bonded to another atom, right? The bond here that holds, that is stored energy, basically, stored energy. And as soon as I break that bond, I release the energy that's been stored. So these lipids, um, have with there are so many bonds and they're so energy rich. That's why um, you know something like in our um, in your boiler at home you burn oil, okay, oil, a lipid, because there's so much more energy in it. If we were to put like sugar water in there and try to burn it, it would flash. It's a very quick release energy. So if you know carbohydrates have generally two times more energy per gram. Now structurally. Um, when you start to put together triglycerides, get the point, a tri, okay, tri means three, right? So we're gonna have three fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule, okay? So here's glycerol down here, okay? Three carbon molecule um, that attaches to three fatty acid tails. Uh, they attach via condensation reactions. So here's your glycerol, here's your three fatty acids. Uh, here's the reaction, so plus, plus, um, and what you get is this molecule here, and since it's condensation, we're gonna spit out three water molecules as a result. 
Uh, phospholipids. And this should seem pretty familiar. This was mentioned in the summer work. Uh, phospholipids are extraordinarily important. They're structural molecules and they are the combination of a glycerol molecule, two fatty acid tails, and a hydrophilic head that's made up of a phosphate group. And a phosphate group is a PO4 um, molecule. It gives any molecule a phosphate is associated with gives that um, an electronegative charge and it's general it is negative and so it creates polar regions as a result so when you have a phospholipid here she is this would be what we consider to be called a space filling almost like the ball and stick that we did to me it looks like somebody who's you know kind of boogieing down and so here's a space filling molecule here's your fatty acid and the reason why one of them is kinked like this right here that kink comes from that double bond that occurs on one of the fatty acid tails. You've got your glycerol molecule right here, okay, and then here's your phosphate group right there. Okay, so that is what gives the head portion of a phospholipid its polar nature, and then the fatty acid tails are fatty acids and are therefore nonpolar. So you get this molecule with a sort of dual personality which there you have. And as we have mentioned, and as we will get further into once we get into the cell, this is the component that makes up membranes. And I'm not just talking cell membrane, like the outer boundary of a cell. I am talking about every single membrane bound structure inside a cell. So if it's an organelle like the nucleus, the nuclear membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, the mitochondria, phospholipid bilayer, endoplasmic reticulum, all of the organelles that are membrane bound have phospholipid bilayers as their separation, their structure, their boundary component. Okay, so what I want you to do is to sketch, uh, either cartoon it, okay, and label it, but sketch out um, what a phospholipid looks like. I'm never going to ask you to necessarily draw it, you know, the exact chemical structural formula of a phospholipid, but what I do want you to be able to do is recognize it. Another class of lipids is known as sterols. Now these are a unique class of lipids because they structurally are very different. They don't have any fatty acid tails, but they are shaped in a four ring structure. So that means they look like that. And again, remembering what I mentioned earlier, every vertice means carbon. So here's the backbone. So here's the backbone. There's another example over here. Okay. And this backbone is um, very, you know, very common in all sterile uh, molecules. They are structural. Uh, that's why we have them. They're metabolic for breakdown. Uh, they're hormonal. Uh, your testosterone, um, estrogen, aldosterone, cortisol, these hormones are all sterile. They're all steroid. That's where the term comes from, steroid hormones, because waxes are another class. Um, and waxes are neat sort of lipids. They're very long fatty acid chains, but they have alcohols associated with them, which give them that watery, almost not, you know, they give it that sort of nature to it, but which makes it kind of cool. So it has this alcohol um, they're attached with carbon rings as well. Those two are structural. Uh, they're very water repellent. Um, and so, you know, you want to think there are waxes that coat um, plants and that's to prevent water loss. Uh, we have wax in us. Think about where you find wax associated with us and why it might be important to be water repellent. And they are nonpolar, right? And that's where that water repellent nature comes in um, is the fact that they are nonpolar. But why? Why would you need them to be? So I want you to kind of consider that piece. And so that is where we're going to end this one today. So take it easy and we'll catch you guys on the flip side.